Hello, I'm Mary Richardson from Stewart Healthcare, and welcome to our webcast, A Conversation with the Experts. Today we're going to discuss minimally invasive gynecological procedures with two Stewart Healthcare physicians who are well versed in this field. They've basically they've seen it all or treated it all. These are medical issues that women are often just too embarrassed to talk about, and that's one thing we're hoping to do, to open up the subject and uh, allow you to learn something about it. So we'll be talking today with two experts, Dr. Sonia Adams and Dr. Sohil Hanjani. So Dr. Adams, let me start with you to ask why you decided to specialize in this field, especially because women are usually so embarrassed to speak to their physician about it. Did you feel that you could handle those issues and help in some way? Absolutely. So, um, you know, my field, urogynecology, female pelvic medicine, and reconstructive surgery is a great field where we get to treat women of all ages, um, really improve their life and their quality of life with some embarrassing problems like urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, um, sometimes pain, and fecal incontinence. And so it's very rewarding to be able to help women with these uh, challenging issues and either medically or surgically treat these issues. Now, do you use robotic surgery on any of those cases, or are they all done laparoscopically? So um, I use whichever method is most appropriate for the patient, and that can be a vaginal approach. Um, it can be laparoscopic or robotic. Now, in your arena, I know that you use the robotic quite a bit, and you're very fond of it. There's still this misnomer, the idea that the robot does the surgery. Explain to us what robotic surgery is. Sure, yeah, that's a very common misconception. Uh, my field, which is more focused on surgery through the abdomen, uh, the robot allowed me to basically take my patients who used to have large incisions and convert them to small incision surgery. And the robot is just a tool that allows me to connect the instruments that I put through those small incisions, small telescope-like devices, connect them to a computer that then I control. The robot really has no ability to do anything by itself. It just translates the actions of my hands into the tips of the instrument. And what's the outcome eventually for the patient who has the robotic surgery? Again, it's the fact that the robot allows us to proceed without doing that big incision, means the patient has smaller incisions to heal from, less pain, less bleeding, a shorter recovery, quicker return to work. So on the patient's side, the robot just allows us to provide them a surgery in a much more so-called minimally invasive manner. Um, Dr. Adams, um, what, one of the most common problems, and I've seen this especially in some of the health fairs we've done with mm -hmm. older women, is urinary incontinence. And it's a, a very embarrassing thing for people, and it does destroy their life in some ways. Um, what are some of the treatments that are available to them, and how, how good are those treatments? Right, so um, urinary incontinence is pretty much divided into two major groups. You can have stress incontinence, which is leaking with coughing, laughing, sneezing, exercise, or more of an overactive bladder kind of symptom complex where people have urgency, frequency, and are getting up at night a lot. So they're the people who, are, who always have to go, and they're going 10, 20 times per day in the bathroom. And depending on which of their symptoms um, is most predominant, we look at that and, and, and evaluate the patient very completely. And if there's a surgical uh, treatment for them, which there often is uh, for stress incontinence, there's a very straightforward procedure that patients can undergo um, in about 30 to 40 minutes in a day surgery procedure, then um, that's a very uh, well accepted and very successful treatment for stress incontinence. For more of an overactive bladder, um, then usually we start with some behavioral uh, counseling and changes, sometimes medication, and then there are other injections and other uh, surgeries that can also be performed, but that's not usually the first line. Mm. Dr. Anjani, what are fibroids? That seems to be a common problem. And what problems do fibroids cause for women? Fibroids are a very common condition in many females. It's one of the main conditions that I deal with. Fibroids are basically small growths, benign, non-cancerous, that grow in the woman's uterus. They're actually very, very common. Up to a fourth of women can have fibroids, sometimes not diagnosed. If they're small, they often don't do anything, and all they need is regular monitoring and visits to your gynecologist. If they're large, they can cause pain, bleeding, pressure problems. 
and they don't always respond very well to medication. So sometimes we try and control the symptoms of fibroids medication, and some of those patients will end up requiring surgery, either to remove the fibroids, so-called myomectomy, or sometimes to remove the whole uterus, which is a hysterectomy, only an option for a woman who's had completed the childbearing. Well, it sounds like, in short, if you suspect you have fibroids or you do, you really do need to see a doctor because it could be something more on the minor end of the scale and something quite serious. Correct, yeah. It, it, you really need some workup, including an exam and usually an ultrasound, to really find out exactly what the fibroids are doing, how big they are, where they are, and then using that knowledge and combining them with the symptoms the patient has you decide what is best for them. Not every patient needs to be treated, but the ones who do need treatment now, they have some options, including surgery. In the past, there used to be this more open surgery. Now we've converted a lot of those surgeries to this minimally invasive approach, either with straight laparoscopy or using robotic laparoscopy to do the surgery. Yeah, I forgot to ask you, in a robotic surgery, does the patient have a shorter recovery time? Is that measurable? Most definitely. Robotic surgery, just like laparoscopic surgery, has a shorter recovery because the incisions are smaller. Mm -hmm. The incisions are dime size, usually three or four in the belly, as opposed to a large three or four inch incision. And that definitely translates into less time in hospital, less pain and a shorter recovery, and a quicker return to work. In both of your fields, you can see that uh, the importance of, of really seeking help because there are uh, there's a spectrum of how things can go. Um, I'm thinking now about uh, pelvic organ prolapse, so that is quite serious. Well, um, it is because it can really affect the quality of life that women have. It can also translate into difficulty emptying your bladder or your bowels um, and a pressure sim pressure symptoms as well as a, a bulge uh, b between. Uh, the legs and and really affect exercise, uh, lifestyle, and many different activities. What causes it? So um, with age, uh, childbearing, uh, genetics, uh, sometimes other risk factors like chronic coughing, um, and just a predisposition to kind of a weakness of the ligaments and tissues, the supportive structures that support the uterus in its normal position and the vaginal walls can become weak, and then they can, they can bulge out um, and, and um, create these symptoms. Mm. And what are, what are some of the possible treatments there? What seems to work best? So there are a lot of different uh, surgical options. Well, we, when we actually counsel patients about uh, surgery for prolapse, we always talk about how there are um, conservative options and then surgical options. So prolapse is a condition where if it's not bothering a patient a lot and it's mild, we can just observe it and we can take measurements and see if it's progressing over the time and if it becomes more bothersome, then we can do something about it. Some women can wear a vaginal pessary, which is a little bit like a diaphragm, to help support the vaginal walls and the uterus and keep it in place. And for some women, this can be a very acceptable uh, thing to try either temporarily or for longer term. Um, and then surgically, there are many, many options available, and it's really uh, individualized to the problem uh, that the woman has and which type of prolapse is most predominant. Okay. Um, Dr. Hanjani, um, one other uh, uh, fairly common, it seems to me, uh, issue is the causes of heavy or irregular periods, excessive bleeding. What causes that and what can be done about that? I mean, you're right, that's a very, very common problem. And every gynecologist sees numerous patients with that. Heavy, irregular periods have a variety of causes depending on the woman's age. And they can range from just hormonal imbalances to abnormalities in the uterus, such as fibroids or polyps or growths. And on the worst end of the scale could be a precancerous or cancerous condition. So if a woman has menses or periods which are not regular, unusually heavy, unusually painful, that patient really needs to come in, get evaluated, which usually means an exam, a pap smear, an ultrasound. And then based on those, they can have further testing and then treatment options, which it can again range from medical options, hormonal regulation, to surgical options, both minor and major. And you wouldn't know unless you are tested and know what's causing it. Correct. There's a, there's a certain amount of testing required. In general, the older the, the woman is, the more serious the problems can be. It's more important they get checked out. But for even younger women, having irregular or heavy or painful periods can be a very significant problem, really interfere with their lifestyles. And it's very well worth that patient coming in and getting evaluated. Um, 
Dr. Adams, I was going to ask you about the mesh. Uh, mm -hmm. I think people, uh, many times, late night TV has commercials right. about if you had the mesh, call immediately at this number. Right. Um, and the question is, what is the real problem with recall of, of the mesh, and which are the meshes that you, we have to be concerned about, and which are fine? In short, um, in 2008 and 2011, the FDA put out a safety notification about mesh used for repair, uh, a vaginal-based repair for prolapse. And, and then subsequently, they asked the manufacturers to perform more studies on those products. And many of those manufacturers did not want to perform more research studies. And so um, essentially, what's happened now is many of those products are off of the market. And that's OK, because we still have really great tools in order to fix prolapse. And uh, the confusing part for patients is to understand uh, what mesh is being uh, really criticized and scrutinized and which mesh is OK. And mesh for slings, especially, which is, are made out of mesh for stress incontinence, are still considered really good procedures to help the leaking with coughing, laughing, sneezing. It's the gold standard procedure that's been around for a long time, and the societies have put out statements that it's really an effective procedure. So women shouldn't be afraid of all mesh, because not all mesh is bad. And, and then there are also prolapse repairs with mesh that are used robotically that are still excellent procedures uh, that have been done for 50 years. So you really have to you know, come, come speak to us about uh, these procedures to know that uh, we're doing things that are safe and, um, and to understand the issues better. On a more personal level, if it was your mother or your grandmother who had one of these issues, and uh, especially you know, when we look back in, the, in, in history, women were just really prone not to want to go to the doctor for anything personal. What would you say to them if somebody really needs to have, get some help, but is reluctant to do it. I'll ask you first. Uh, most definitely. When it comes to you know, women's issues, many of them can be very difficult, embarrassing situations. But uh, I, I find that the vast majority of gynecologists are very good at taking care of the patients, dealing with these rather difficult situations, and providing patients options which, once they're carried through and once the patients have the treatment, being medical surgery, the patients are very, very happy afterwards. And very often they feel that, you know, they wish they'd done something sooner. Yes. And I think that's a very important message to give to them, that it's okay to get seen. There's really nothing you're going to tell your gynecologist he has never heard, heard he's <laughs> never heard before. <laughs> he's nothing you're going to say is going to be too embarrassing for him. And then the options they provide for you will make huge differences in your life. And I find that a lot of the surgeries I do, for example, robotics, uh, were initially started on people that I knew. A lot of my patient, initial patients were staff at the hospital, a lot of nurses. People knew me, so they understood the procedures, they came to the doctor, even though they knew me and there was some degree of embarrassment there, they knew that the results would be so good they would change their lives, and they've done very well, and they've been very happy with the outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Dr. Adams? Well, I would just say that um, I had the pleasure of seeing one of my patients in follow-up very recently, and she is 85 and had stress incontinence, and we placed a sling for her recently, and she is just so happy, and she just wishes she had done it sooner. So just like you said, um, there are a lot of women who, you know, it's, people are not too old for it. You, you know, you should seek treatment if it's a problem, and, and um, if we, we can find the right procedure for you, if that's what you're interested in undergoing, and, and make, you, make you better. Well, thank you both so much for being with us today and sharing such good information. Dr. Sonia Adams and Dr. Sohil Hanjani. Uh, and thank you, too, for our audience for uh, sharing this program with us. And keep your eyes out for more of a conversation with the experts. And thanks for being with us today.